at the beginning of all things, the Word. God and the Word. At the beginning of all things, the Word and God. All things became what they are through the Word. Without the Word, nothing ever became anything. It was the Word that made everything alive. And it was this being alive that has been the light by which we have found our way. The Word became human and lived a life like ours. We saw the splendor, love splendor, real splendor. You may be seated. It is my great delight and honor to welcome all of you to Union Theological Seminary's 177th Commencement Ceremony. <laughs> 176 classes of students have walked across this stage in its many forms, and I am completely confident that another 177 will follow. But today is the day that we honor 
the graduation of the class of 2015. First of all, I want to say a big word of welcome, especially since this year has been a year in which climate change has been so central to the work of Union. I want to welcome in this beautiful weather, this sky, the day that God has given us. I want to welcome all of the family members and friends who are here to celebrate with your loved ones as they receive their diplomas. We're very happy that you're here. I want to welcome Union's Board of Trustees and the Chair of the Board of Trustees, Dick Dunham. We are happy to have you here and thank you for your hard work. We welcome the administration and we welcome all of the members of the facility staff in particular who have made this lawn so beautiful for us. We welcome back our mother duck who has built her nest in the corner of the quad back there for the fourth year in a row. <laughs> and now I'm going to ask to stand a special group of people who I welcome here today. They have walked every inch of this past with you. I'd like for the union faculty to please rise. We welcome you to this ceremony. And now, I would like to ask the class of 2015 to rise. <coughs> How to describe you. How to describe you. You are the class of love and action. You are the class of the love hub the class of the womanist chair, the class of Black Lives Matters, the class that went from doing selfies to doing ussies, <laughs> the class that went from just us to justice. You are an epic class, and your presence at Union has been remarkable, and your legacy will stand long. And I am very proud to have been the president of this institution while you have blessed these corridors and classrooms, dorm rooms and pub and hub and pit and all the other nooks and crannies of the places where your lives have been transformed by this place. It is now my great honor to say to the chair of the Board of Trustees of Union Seminary, Mr. Dunham, we the faculty have the honor this afternoon to formally present to you and to the other members of the board our students who have completed every single requirement necessary for their degrees. Thank you, President Jones. It's a great honor to serve as chair of the Board of Trustees, and I know that I know how deeply all the trustees uh, are committed to Union Theological S Seminary and its unique mission, supporting President Jones and the faculty and the administration and the whole staff <coughs> toward a stronger global union. Uh, on behalf of the board, I want to congratulate each graduating student for the extraordinary accomplishments that we mark with this commencement. And I thank your families and friends for accompanying you through your journey that started years ago. With this <coughs> diploma, uh, we put our trust in you. Uh, to accept even bigger challenges in service of a world that needs you. On the recommendation of the faculty of the seminary, the trustees have today voted to confer degrees upon members of the class of 2015. I ask Dean Boyce
to present the members of this class. Thank you, Mr. Dunham. We begin with the candidates who have completed the degree Master of Divinity. Bridget Kelso Anthony. Elizabeth Maria Asenza. Emily Sheridan Brewer. Keith Fisher Connor. Janet Leleth Cox. Michael Germain Crumpler. Lisa Asadedu Cunningham. Charles Cruz Daly. Dylan Thomas Doyle DeBellis. Emily Ann Detar. Kyle Jerome Easton. <laughs> Stephanie Jane Gannon. <laughs> Matlin Gilman. <laughs> Samantha Ann Gonzalez Block. <laughs> Emily Frances Hamilton. Ranwa Hamami. Matthew David Hoffman. Dorothy Addison Hutchison. Maggie Jerry. Vandalin Joanne Kennedy. Alan Nicely, <laughs> Terrace Kruger, <laughs> Nicholas Lassetti, <laughs> Melissa W. Lampkin, <laughs> Megan Page Miller, <laughs> Pilar Milholland, <laughs> Rashad. Raymond Moore, <laughs> Lindsay Ann Nye, <laughs> Kamara Rose O'Connor, <laughs> Shay O'Reilly, <laughs> Sandra O'Farrell, <laughs> Sung One Park in Absentia, <laughs> Natalie Renee Perkins. Benjamin James Perry. Sue H. Ream. Jason Scott Riff in absentia. Anne Marie Roderick. Blanca Iris Rodriguez. Amy Vanessa Rogers. Stephen Sarma Wireman. Rhonda Rachelbach Sarazin. This way. This way. <laughs> Steph 
Anthony D. Stovall. Taryn Thomas Strauss. Devon Thomas in absentia. Lillian Elizabeth Tinker Fortell. Zachary George Walter. Carol Ann Wilkins. Mr. Dunham and President Jones, we now present two recipients of the Master of Divinity degree who will receive the Master of Science in Social Work degree on May 27th at Hunter College. Cindy Eunice Morales Garcia. Jacob Reese. We continue with the candidates for the degrees of Master of Arts, Master of Sacred Theology, and Master of Philosophy. Candidates for the degree Master of Arts. Hunter Beasley. <laughs> William Bellamy. <laughs> Emily Costaneda in absentia. Joseph William Dahlstrom. <laughs> Isabel Garcia Spiegel. <laughs> Amy Maria Hernandez. <laughs> J. Ronell Hooper. David A. Larrabee. Mary Catherine McCarthy. David Michael McFarlane in absentia. Jamie A. Myers. Robert Michael Nadick. Foster James Pinckney. <laughs> Kaylin Randall, in absentia. Jeremy Scott Vinson. <laughs> Kevin R. Worthy. <laughs> we now present the candidates for the degree Master of Sacred Theology. Philip Benjamin Bagro. Christopher Fici. Ross Jesmont. Roisin McMillan. Esther Parajuli. Valerie Ann Roth. Amir Mar Solomon Tawadras. We now present the, the, the candidates for the degree Master of Philosophy. Chloe Breyer. Crystal L. Hall. Mary Julia Jett. <laughs> Amy Elizabeth Neverton. <laughs> David Orr in absentia. Charlene K. Sinclair. <laughs> Heather Lynn Wise Wilhoit. Jason Andrew Wyman, Jr. I now ask Professor John McGuckin to introduce the joint degree candidates 
who will receive degrees in cooperation with the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences of Columbia University. Professor McGuckin. Mr. Dunham and President Jones, I present the following students who have received a degree from Columbia University in the joint program in religion with Union Theological Seminary. These are the Masters of Arts, all in absentia. Mark Edward Bamforth, Nicholas Allen Bickford, Dorothy Chang, Elizabeth Dolphy, Joseph Andrew Fisher, Riley Blanchard Kellogg, Yang Chen Lu, Jonathan Edward, Tomas Desislava, K. Vendava. <laughs> President Jones, it is my pleasure to present the following students, again in absentia, who have fulfilled the requirements for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. Joseph Lee Blankholm, Jonathan Yisrael Brafman, Joel Eugene Bordeaux, Leanne Francesca Carlson, Christopher Donald Kelly, and Husuan Li Wang. <laughs> Mr. Dunham and President Jones, it is my pleasure now to present to you Matthew Joseph Pereira, who has fulfilled the requirements for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. The title of his dissertation is Reception, Interpretation and Doctrine in the Sixth Century, John Maxentius and the Scythian Monks. Brothers and sisters, I present to you Dr. Matthew Joseph Pereira. colleagues who have served as advisors to present their candidates for the Doctor of Philosophy degree. Mr. Dunham, President Jones, it's my pleasure to present to you Pia Sophia Chaudhari. <laughs> She has fulfilled the requirements for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. The title of her dissertation is, That which is not assumed is not healed, Explorations in Orthodox Christian Ontology, Soteriology, and Depth Psychology. Brothers and sisters, I present to you Dr. Pia Sophia Chaudhary. Mr. Dunham, President Jones, it's my pleasure to present to you the Reverend Stuart James Everett, who has fulfilled the requirements for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. The title of his dissertation is The Comic Balance Toward a Pastoral Embrace of Humor. Brothers and sisters, I present to you the Reverend Doctor Stuart James Everett. Mr. Dunham, President Jones, it is my pleasure to present Makito Nagasawa, who has fulfilled the requirements for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. 
The title of his dissertation, Hegel and Karatani on Politics, Economics, and Religion, Exploring New Relationships. Brothers and sisters, I present to you Dr. Makito Nagasawa. Mr. Dunham, President Jones, it is my pleasure to present Matthew Emil Vaughn, who has fulfilled the requirements for the degree Doctor of Philosophy. The title of his dissertation is Scriptural Reasoning as Interreligious Education. Brothers and sisters, I present to you Dr. Matthew Emil Vaughn. And I would now like to invite uh, alumni, dear friend, uh, Dr. Teresa Delgado, who is representing the Alumni Council, who will now address the graduates as you move into that new category of alumni. Dr. Delgado? Good afternoon, compañeras and compañeros of the class of 2015. Just 10 years ago, I sat where you're sitting right now. And now your journey as a union alumnus begins. What tremendous trailblazers have cleared your path as teachers, wisdom guides, and fellow students. You walk today and forevermore with Beverly Harrison and Ada Maria Sassi Diaz, with James Washington and Kozuke Koyama, with Ellen Mitchell and Letty Russell, with Eunice Jackson, Coleman Brown, and Walter Wink. Their spirit and energy permeate this space, its walls, the ground upon which you walk, the air that we breathe. They are with us, they're with you as you journey forth with a passion for making peace with justice in and for this world. On behalf of the alumni and alumni council of our beloved seminary, I welcome you, class of 2015, as companion and member of the Union Alumni and Alumni Network. As part of this worldwide network of justice seekers and change makers, I encourage you to continue to make a mark on this space as you have so faithfully done during your years here. Come back when you can for events like Union Days, for network chapter gatherings, and by using the Union website as an ongoing resource. Stay connected with this space in an intentional way. Allow it to continue to nurture you and bless it with your voice you will always be a valued part of this community. And I encourage you to give back as you are able by recruiting prospective students, by mentoring current students, by continuing to engage in justice advocacy, and by contributing in any way you can, financially and in kind, as you've already done so generously with your class gift to the Jackson Mitchell Womanist Chair here at Union. I think you know, I certainly know, what a very special group you are, class of 2015. You created, sustained, and nurtured a hub of love. You marched, sang, and stood in silent witness. You prayed with your legs, as Rabbi Heschel did decades ago. You went to jail 
You fed each other. You listened to the travails of nature and of our youth. You were present fully and purposefully because black lives matter, because earth matters, because the poor matter, because loving who we love matter, because love and justice matters. Welcome, welcome to the ranks of the Union Theological Seminary alumni and alumnae. Thank you. And I would now like to invite Natalie Renee Perkins from the class of 2015 and your student senate co-chair for this past year to present the class gift. Natalie? So we as the 2015 class entering recognized the legacy of womanism the minute we walked through the doors and the possibility of a woman as chair. So we banded together to help raise money for this chair. And as the entire student body, this is graduating class of 2015, 2016, 2017, we have raised $5,001. A member of Union's Board of Trustees who wishes to remain anonymous has very generously decided to match student funds up to $5,000. So we, the 15, 2015 graduating class of Union Theological Seminary, are pleased to present on the behalf of the entire student body to the Womanist Chair Endowment $10,001. On the street last Sunday, feeling mighty low and kind of mean. Suddenly a voice said, go forth, neighbor, spread your picture on a wider screen. And the voice said, neighbor, there's a million reasons why you should be glad in all four seasons. Hit the road, neighbor, leave your worries and strife. Spread the religion of the rhythm of life. Of the rhythm of life is a powerful beat. Puts a tingle in your fingers and a tingle in your feet. Rhythm on the inside, rhythm on the street, and the rhythm of life is a powerful beat. Make a great sensation, have a growing congregation, lead a glowing operation here below. Like a pied piper blowing, lead and keep the music flowing, keep the rhythm go, go, going, go, go, go. go. You will make a great sensation, have a growing congregation, growing, growing operation here below. Like a pied piper blowing, lead and keep the music flowing, keep the rhythm go, go, going, go, go, go. You will make a great sensation, have a growing congregation, build a growing operation here below. Like a pied piper blowing, lead and keep the music flowing, keep the rhythm going. Rhythm on the inside, rhythm on the street, and the 
stage, <laughs> I'm going to ask you to join me at the podium. <laughs> Hannah Rose retires after 32 years, 32 of offering tune after tune to our worship and community life. For the gifts of music, poetry, and beauty, we say thanks and present to you this plaque in recognition of your service. <laughs> May this union doorknob <laughs> open the way to unexpected pleasures and new musical adventures in your retirement. I would just like to make one correction. We always say here, in the beginning was the word. Well, no, in the beginning was the beat. <laughs> President Jones and I would like to announce that, as far as we know, the class gift this year was the largest class gift ever given. So we thank you, thank you. And we challenge the class of 2016, not that we need to compete. It is now our pleasure to announce the prizes and special awards of Union and Auburn seminaries. They are awarded by decision of the union faculty to students who have been nominated by them, for them by the academic fields or by prize committees. Students of all denominations and faith traditions are eligible for all prizes and awards. A brief description of the awards is printed in your program. We will begin with the presentation of the awards given by Auburn Seminary with Seminary President Catherine Rhodes Henderson. Dr. Henderson. Mr. Dunham and President Jones, it gives me great pleasure to present the Auburn Awards. The Anne McGrew Bennett and John Coleman Bennett Fellowship of Auburn, given for a ministry in social justice. This Tennessee native served as a volunteer in Guatemala in 2009 and interned with the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship. During her field placement at Broadway Presbyterian Church, she led the young adults in a study of environmental and food justice. This passionate worker for justice is Emily Brewer. Yeah! The Robert Wood Lynn Fellowship is giving, given for a teaching ministry. Effervescent and energetic, this graduate exudes a love for teaching. Gifted with a love of children and immersed in the Wesleyan tradition, she emanates the spirit of love divine, all loves excelling. This year's Robert Wood Lynn Fellowship awardee is Megan Miller.
The Maxwell Fellowship goes to two people this year for promise of pastoral excellence and ministry, and pastoral ministry. The first awardee served as student life assistant, led interseminary salsa sessions for Union and Jewish theological students, and is poised to start a position as assistant pastor in Asheville, North Carolina. <laughs> Samantha Gonzalez Block. Um, and our second awardee plays the saxophone and banjo, has lived in the Netherlands and served as Minister of Fun for the Student Senate. Among the many accomplishments in which he takes pride, the greatest is skydiving with his grandmother. <laughs> this awardee is Benjamin Perry. I continue with the awards presented by Union Seminary. The Charles Augustus Briggs Award. A student of social ethics, this awardee will soon move to the Windy City to begin a PhD in theology at the University of Chicago. Described as deep-souled and perceptive, he delivers stunning insight in such an understated way that it catches his classmates off guard. The Charles Augustus Briggs Award winner is Foster Pinckney. The Win Wright Prize for Biblical Languages. A creative writing major at Johns Hopkins who is fascinated by ancient texts and translation issues, this first year MA student from Iowa aced Greek. The Win Wright Prize for Biblical Languages goes to Ian White. the James Meilenberg Prize in Biblical Scholarship. The Meilenberg Prize is shared by two outstanding biblical scholars. This seminarian at St. Michael's Episcopal Church worked for sojourners, was involved in interfaith youth corps, and participated in Union's travel seminar to El Salvador in January. The first James Meilenberg Prize winner is Anne Marie Roderick. The second Meilenberg Prize winner has already been on this stage twice today, wants to receive an award and wants to receive a diploma. So I can announce that she is the newly named co-director of the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship, Emily Brewer.
the Hitchcock Prize in Church History. This Texan with a background in digital marketing and copywriting came to pursue ethics at Union and develop his fascination with the thought of John Calvin. It appears, however, that he was led astray by the intrigues of the fourth century church, especially the great rhetorician Gregory the Theologian. Union awards the Hitchcock Prize to David McFarlane in absentia. The Julius Thomas Hanson Memorial Award is shared this year by two graduating Master of Divinity students. The first awardee, a runner from upstate New York, thinks intensely about the theological questions of our time. He combines a critical and probing spirit with an imagination deeply faithful to Christian tradition and language, Kyle Easton. The second awardee, a talented gospel pianist, intern at Abyssinian Baptist Church, a Morehouse College alum, is headed to the PhD program in philosophy and education at Teachers College, Columbia University, Rashad Raymond Moore. The Daniel Day Williams Fellowship Award this year is awarded to a jazz drummer who graduated from Kalamazoo College, edits the Union Seminary Quarterly Review, and plays disc golf, whatever that is. <laughs> Jason Wyman. Hudnut Award. Two second year Master of Divinity students share this award. While this Texas native who forsook Malibu for New York has been preaching since the age of nine, at Union he has learned to step into the moment. This year's first Hudnut Award goes to the Assistant Minister at King's Church of Christ, Stanley Tyrone Talbert. Sharing the Hudnut Award is a mother and gifted jazz singer who has modeled a new form of poetic sung preaching. She describes herself as having feet rooted in the gospel, a heart filled with soul, and a voice touched with jazz. Union honors pioneering jazz preacher Chandra Rule. The Robert E. Seaver Award. Two students who have worked on many projects together share the Robert E. Seaver Award this year. 
The first awardee organized and directed a Boy Scouts leadership training program, played NCAA volleyball in college, and worked as a policy analyst at Homeland Security. A gospel choir member, performer in Broadway Review and the Thecla Project, Union Honors, Lindsay Nye. This New Mexico native found his voice in leading congregational song at Union, at music that makes community, and at St. Lydia's Dinner Church. A multi-instrumentalist, artist, and chess player, Zachary Walter joins Lindsay as a Robert Seaver awardee. <laughs> Karen Ziegler Feminist Preaching Prize has two recipients this year. A former actor at the North Carolina Theater, this student senate co-chair, singer, food lab worker, and advocate of 92nd sermons, has found true fame as a leader of Union's Happy Video. The, the Karen Ziegler Feminist Preaching Prize goes in the first instance to Natalie Renee Perkins. <laughs> Sharing the Ziegler Prize is a storyteller, playwright, author, student life assistant, orientation coordinator, and fiercely proud mother of Mikai, Bridget Kelso Anthony. At this moment, I would like to announce that the recipient, we have two recipients in the audience today who received an award from Madison Avenue Presbyterian Church in honor of the great preacher David H. C. Reed. Because this is not a union award, we will not give a check from union, but I simply want to note and have the two stand up that we have two finalists this is a very great honor for the union, uh, union preachers. And so I would like to recognize Samantha Gonzalez Block and Emily Brewer. Will you please just stand? The Malcolm Boyd Veritas Award. Known for his complicated homemade muffins, withering socioeconomic critiques of neoliberalism, and deeply felt convictions about the Trinity. This year's Malcolm Boyd Veritas Award goes to the new executive assistant at Union Center for Earth Ethics, Shay Gabriel O'Reilly. Interreligious Engagement Award being given for the first time this year by vote of the Interreligious Engagement Field. 
With a graduate degree in public health already in hand, this Interreligious Engagement Prize awardee left law school to attend Union. During her time at Union, she constructively grappled with her multifaceted religious identity, including her Muslim upbringing, and has demonstrated consistent intellectual excellence. The Interreligious Engagement Awardee is Ranwa Hamani. The final prize is the Traveling Fellowship. Two graduating Master of Divinity students share this year's Traveling Fellowship for their outstanding scholarship, and I present them in alphabetical order. Described as amazingly good-natured, full of wonder, and with laser-like focus, this Traveling Fellow was a Teach for America Corps member, worked in commercial real estate, and aspires to follow, quote, what sets my heart on fire. Union honors Megan Page Miller. Described as luminous, astute, and analytical, this traveling fellow is one of nine children, had a career as an attorney, and is certified in the resolution of conflict. Known for her commitment in prison ministry and for her moral passion, Union honors Blanca Iris Rodriguez.
From the book of Revelation. John writes, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, producing fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree of life are for the healing of the nations. In 1981, 
the Board of Directors of Union Theological Seminary established the Union Medal as the seminary's highest award to honor persons of faith whose lives reflect the mission of the seminary in the world. Union Medalists include people engaged in works of ministry in congregations, in public service, in government, in business, in education, and in the arts. We are pleased to announce that the board has voted to award this year's Union Medals to two persons, Mandy Carter and Al Gore. I now invite Ms. Mandy Carter to come forward. You are an epic class and you are getting an epic graduation. I'm going to now read the citation that we are giving to Mandy Carter. Mandy Carter, you have been a human rights activist, public policy advocate, and grassroots organizer your whole life. You have co-founded three groundbreaking organizations, Southerners on New Ground, SONG, and the National Black Justice Coalition, NBJC, and the National Coordinator, your role, of the Bayard Rustin 2013 Commemoration Project. But most importantly, you have been the unsurpassed, the unsurpassed coalition builder of several generations. You remind all of us every day and every hour of every day that we are, all of us, every single individual on this planet, in this together. And that, and this is your phrase, there is no justice unless there is justice and equality for all. It is not just us, it is justice. Your unwavering courage in proclaiming yourself as an out Southern black lesbian social justice activist. Yes! Has long been a guiding beacon to all those who are seeking to find their true selves and to do so in supportive community. Working with the Freedom to Marry Collaborative and other groups, you have fought the good fight for marriage equality beginning in Massachusetts quite a bit of time ago and you continue to do so. As executive director of SONG, you integrated work against homophobia into the freedom struggles of the South. You forged unity from divisions of class, race, culture, gender, and sexual identity. You gave us that model, and the National Black Justice Coalition, which you co-founded, to this day remains the only national civil rights organization of concerned black, lesbians, gay, bisexual, and transgendered individuals and allies dedicated to promoting equality by combating both racism and homophobia. We honor you today because your life and your activism embody the highest ideals and aspirations of this school, Union Theological Seminary, in the city of New York, for your stellar coalition building, for creating transformative models of organizing that work, that truly connect, for being out visible and vocal as the face and the voice so often for those who cannot be out themselves. And for continuing to ask over and over, are we about justice? Are we about just us? For all of these reasons, we award you union's highest honor, the Union Medal.
I now invite Ms. Carter to deliver her charge to the graduates. Ms. Carter. Thank you. Woo! Mr. Dunham, President Jones, VP Al Gore. <laughs> to the class of 2015, congratulations to each and every one of you graduating today. As you now prepare for what will be your next, not only in your ministries, but also for what will be your next journeys. I want to give a heartfelt thank you to Union for receiving today's Union Medal as the first ever out LGBTQI SGL recipient. Thus, the rainbow t-shirt, the rainbow t-shirt that I actually got last night from the Queer Commissioning Service as a gift from the LGBTQI Commissioning Commission graduates, and I wear this proudly in honor of you. But I thought one of the most remarkable moments in addition to all those who were commissioned was the commissioning of the empty chair. The empty chair that represents, for whatever reason, those who cannot be out. But what I shared with those graduating for those who can is that when you have the ability and the gift to be out and visible, please do so because you do become the faces for those who cannot be seen and you do become the voices for those who cannot be heard. And with that, I dedicate my, dedicate my remarks to two people who I have never met but it not only impacted my life as a young black lesbian coming out, but continue to do so for all sets of people, Bayard Rustin and Audrey Lord. Black, gay, lesbian, Bayard Quaker, all that stuff, social justice advocates, activists. Because one of the things I always felt interesting, and I lead, in fact, when I think about this charge for those of you who are graduating and moving on, the power of one. That each and every one of you, depending on where you're going to be going and what you're going to be doing, have the potential to impact not only your life, but those around you. and understanding that when you think about the power of one, sometimes you don't see it immediately. I can understand the frustration sometimes, I'm doing this, but I'm not seeing the results right away. Well, if anyone who stood on that Edmund Pettus Bridge, March 7th and the 8th, who could have told anyone back 50 years ago when they tried to tell people, you're not gonna be voting in this state or this country and we'll kill you, would stand there in absolute amazement and total silence as older John Lewis, stood right next with the Edmund Pattis Bridge sign with the first ever African-American president of this country. That's what you talk about, the power of one and having the ability to hang in. <laughs> this morning I went to chapel and I, I wrote down some of these quotes and this is a question I have. Now that I've been here, Sue, I went to our lunch uh, Thursday, I went to the Queering Commission and yesterday, I went to chapel today. Does this mean that I've been unionized? I don't know what the heck that means. Is that, is that good? Okay. <laughs> so I need to say, I bring you greetings from the great state of North Carolina. We bought you some gifts. We finally have Loretta Lynch as our U.S. Attorney General. Hello. Born in Greensboro, North Carolina. We have gift, gift of the Moral Monday movement. And I think we're going to snap some of you up coming up to North Carolina real soon when you graduate, if I'm not mistaken. 
And I do bring you greetings on behalf of Southerners on New Ground and, and BJ, the National Black Justice Coalition, because I think, and when you think about what you're going to be doing, where you're going to be going, what you perceive to be your journey and what you want to do to influence others, the question really becomes, what happens if it doesn't exist at the moment? And I would say for those of us, and by the way, there's a 79 million of us, these post-World War II baby boomers of the 60s, we're still here for the long haul. And one of the most important lessons we've learned that we now have 79 million of us, 80 million of you millennials, if ever there was a time for us to come together, have conversation, talk about what we're going to do and how we're going to do that in unity, that there has to be a sense of what's the big framing of what we're looking at in terms of what we want to have happen, can have happen, and it doesn't matter what language. Clean air, clean water, no one should be homeless, no one should be hungry. Everyone should act, have access to an education and good health at the bare minimum. You just get that's just cuz. And sadly, the reason why you have the first ever African American, the first ever, whatever the first ever might be, because we found people to say, well, that might be what we want and value, because profit ends up being more important than people things get in the way. That said, I, I think it underscores to each of you graduating to be fully engaged in the call to action focused on bringing our collective voices together. Bringing our collective voices together to work together to break down systems of oppression, whether it be based on, and that laundry list is very important, race, class, culture, gender, language, ability, sexual orientation, gender, orient, gender, uh, gender identification, or any other identities that are often used to pit us against each other rather than how we work together in coalition and partnership with each other. That's the journey, that's the task. And as you proceed, each one of you, to liberating any and all who live at any and all of those intersections, look at this, look at this, look at this space. How many are walking around every day, waking up in those multiple identities, living in those multiple identities? And where words and action, your words and actions, who your partnership in words and actions that reflect intersectionality, intentionality, intergenerational, multiracial, collaborations, cooperation, partnerships, these are the words that as you move forward, these are the things that we wake up and think about every day. And if you add in the wonderful thing called passion and compassion, is part of why we do this. No guarantee it might work, but my goodness, you might want to get out here and try. <laughs> Which will make a difference. And each of you who are graduating have the ability to contribute. And as I close, contribute to what? This notion about when these lands were first settled, just, I want to just route these quick demographics because I'm not an organizer and that's what you're going to be walking into. It's, here's a few. By 2050, this country will be majority people of color. California already is. However, who is already here indigenous to these lands before any ships pull up to these shores? Who's here? We're just coming around the bend. And maybe perhaps some of the pushback that we're getting is the reality check that people know exactly what we know. It's called demographics and that multi-generational, intergenerational thing that also happens. But here's the thing that I'll leave you with, that if we are real serious and committed about the values that really represent union, are we really about full equality and justice for all? That said, congratulations. I will see you out there, because I know I'm going to bump into you doing some kind of organizing of some sort. And huge thank you. And to the families and friends, because how many first generation students out here? Any? Thank you. Makes a difference. Thank you so much. I'm humbled, honored.
I now invite Vice President Al Gore to come forward. So I will now read the citation, it's right here, to our second Union Medal awardee. Al Gore, you have been an elected official of the United States government, serving in turn as congressman, senator, and vice president. You are a best-selling author an Oscar winner, and a Nobel laureate. But most importantly, for us here today, you have been the single most resolute catalyst for action against global warming. You have roused and inspired. <laughs> you have roused and inspired the environmental activist in each of us. With your harrowing and bluntly effective slideshows, graphs, timelines, bell curves, sea level charts, oxygen isotope statistics, and carbon emission data, and your lucid and succinct summary of central arguments, you have formulated for all of us a cogent, user-friendly introduction to global warming that has made inroads that are impossible to measure into the collective imagination. You changed that imagination. Because of your work featured in the documentary film, An Inconvenient Truth, and your book of the same title, governments, politicians, faith leaders, secular activists, seminarians, and ordinary people have united around the world in learning how to celebrate our God-given mission to care for the creation that God entrusted to us. The Religions for Earth Conference held here at Union to examine the moral imperative, the moral imperative to care for our natural world. The People's Climate March, the UN Climate Summit in New York, all of this can be said to have grown from the seeds of your work. Your life, I need to say your amazing offspring. <laughs> your life and your activism embody the highest ideals and aspirations of union theological seminary in the city of New York for your unremitting courage in uncovering and delivering the truth, for your tireless campaign to put climate change on every personal and political agenda imaginable, and for mobilizing a global multi-faith network that will support, promises to support, ongoing environmental activism and commitment to the cause for generations to come, we so proudly award you Union's highest honor, the Union Medal. Thank you so Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now invite Mr. Gore to deliver his charge to the graduates. Mr. Gore. Thank you very much. Chairman Dick Dunham, thank you. The Reverend Dr. Serene Jones, thank you. Uh, that introduction, I must say, last week America lost a former Speaker of the House, uh, Jim Wright of Texas. And the, in the honor of his memory, I'm going to recall a line I heard him deliver after an over-the-top introduction. <clears throat> he said, I just wish my mother and father could have heard that. 
My father would have enjoyed that, and my mother would have believed it. <laughs> Thank you, uh, President Jones, uh, to the faculty and the staff, uh, to my fellow honoree, Mandy Carter. What a wonderful talk, and this honor for me is doubled by the honor of receiving it on the same stage with you. Thank you for all that you stand for. And thank you for giving me an entree to, uh, to say I am so proud of my daughter, Corinna, and so proud of Union for establishing the Center for Earth Ethics, which is a very exciting new initiative. Most of all, to the graduates, congratulations to your families and loved ones who are so happy for you just to see the joy on your faces as you cross this stage and what a magnificent day this is the way a ceremony like this should take place in a beautiful setting with the weather perfect uh, i i was trying to i went to the vanderbilt graduate school of religion i have to admit I dropped out. <laughs> but while I was there, I learned from Paul Tillich and Reinhold Niebuhr's works, and I'm envious of all the union students who have this amazing faculty and the tradition of really such an out, unique in all the world, Union Theological Seminary. But I was trying to remember when I did graduate uh, from college, and I asked Mandy, I said, do you remember who spoke at your graduation? She said, no, I have no idea who spoke at my graduation, so I'm not uh, optimistic that you'll remember anything I've said. <laughs> and it's been a long time ago. Uh, I was reminded of that recently when um, a woman came, a true story, not long ago, a woman came up to me uh, in, a, in a restaurant, and just stared at me and I didn't think anything of it and she walked on past and then a minute later she came from the opposite direction and so I said how do you do and she said you know if you dyed your hair black you'd look just like Al Gore <laughs> and so I said thank you and she said you sound like him too but uh, I also want to uh, honor a previous uh, winner of the Union Medal, Judith Moyers, who is here, and Bill will be joining us uh, a little bit later. My charge to the graduates, we need your leadership. You have now been trained by one of the finest institutions anywhere in the world in theological inquiry and pastoral care. You now have the skills most needed to assist humanity in navigating the most treacherous and most consequential transition in the history of our civilization. I'm going to speak briefly about the climate crisis. There are really only three questions that need to be answered about the climate crisis. Must we change, can we change, and should we change? They seem superficially similar, but they are actually all very distinct and different. The first two, must we change and can we change, are factual questions. They can be answered by resorting to the best available evidence as judged by persons utilizing the rule of reason. When you take them together, they resemble the old cliche about the Chinese way of expressing the word crisis with two characters, one of which is danger, the other of which is opportunity. So when you hear the danger as I answer the question, must we change? Remember that the opportunity quickly follows as part of the answer to the question, can we change? Today, humanity will put 110 million tons of global warming pollution into the atmosphere of this planet. When Copernicus wrote The Revolution of the Spheres, he said our perspective as human beings standing on this earth deceives us because we have the impression the sun rises from one side of the earth and goes around to the other side of the earth. But our sense of distance uh, is deceiving us. The sun is much farther than the top 
of the sky. In that same way, our perspective about the atmosphere and our relationship to it deceives us. The sky looks limitless and vast, but it is a very thin layer surrounding the planet. And 110 million tons of chemical uh, heat trapping pollution every 24 hours adds up. In fact, the accumulated amount today traps as much extra heat energy in the Earth's system every day, uh, equivalent to the energy released by 400,000 Hiroshima atomic bombs exploding every day. It's a big planet, but that is a lot of energy, and the heat is rising. Last month, uh, April, was the 362nd month in a row with temperatures hotter than the 20th century average. Last year was the 38th year in a row hotter than the 20th century average. It was in fact the hottest year ever measured in history since instruments have been used. The first three months of this year were the hottest first three months of any year in history. 90% of this extra heat energy goes into the oceans and this city saw the consequences when Superstorm Sandy crossed areas of the Atlantic Ocean nine degrees Fahrenheit warmer than normal and became far more extensive and destructive than it would have been otherwise just two and a half years ago. One and a half years ago, Typhoon Haiphan, uh, Haiyan crossed waters of the Pacific Ocean to the windward of the Philippines five degrees Fahrenheit warmer than normal and became the most destructive ocean-based storm ever to make landfall and destroyed the communities of Tacloban uh, and others. The water cycle is being disrupted profoundly. The amount of water vapor coming off the oceans from the warmer oceans is increasing. The warmer air holds more. And because of physics that are above my pay grade, but which have been uh, laid out very dutifully by the scientific community, that makes the downpours much bigger and extends the time between the downpours. Today, Dallas, Texas is flooding. Last week, I was in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and they spoke of a flood a few years ago that exceeded the 500-year flood limit by five feet. My own hometown of Nashville, two years after that, had similarly a 500-year flood. This is happening all over the world now on a regular basis. And the same extra heat that evaporates water off the oceans and holds it in the warmer air also pulls it out of the first few centimeters of the soil and makes the droughts far more extensive and longer than they otherwise would be. 98% of our largest state, California, is in drought today. 47% is in the most extreme form of drought. The largest city in the Western Hemisphere, Sao Paulo, in Brazil, is now debating water rationing two days on and five days off. All around the world, floods, downpours, mudslides, droughts are, are creating havoc and threatening governance. It was a drought from 2006 to 2010 related to the climate crisis that drove a one million refugees from the 60% of the farms in Syria that were destroyed by that drought into the cities. 80% of the livestock were killed. There they collided with another 1.5 million refugees from the Iraq war. And WikiLeaks told us that the internal dialogue of the Syrian government was replete with warnings. We cannot handle this. There will be a social explosion. And the gates of hell have opened in Syria. Other factors have contributed as they contribute to other disasters and failures of governance that are tipped over the edge by the extra stress of the worsening climate crisis as climate refugees flood across borders. The oceans are threatened and the extinction crisis now called the sixth great extinction calls us to remember a teaching from, the, from my faith tradition, the Judeo-Christian uh, tradition, Noah was called upon, keep them alive with thee. We've lost half the animals on this planet in the last 40 years. Not species, the individual animals. Thank goodness you're saving this duck back here uh, in, in the corner of the courtyard. What a wonderful home that duck's family has found. But they warn us that by the end of this century, 50% of the living species are at risk because of the climate crisis 
and other factors. And so must we change? Yes, we must change. Should we respond to these facts by saying, I have an idea, let's drill for oil in the Arctic Ocean. I don't think so. When will we start changing in the right direction? The facts tell us that we must change. I mentioned that this first question, like the second, is based on fact. You use the word truth in your generous introduction. My tradition also teaches you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Mahatma Gandhi taught that satyagraha or truth force is the most powerful force for change in the world. The great author of The Road Less Traveled, M. Scott Peck, once was asked in an interview, what is evil? And he said evil is the absence of truth. The German philosopher Theodor Adorno conducted a moral autopsy of the Third Reich when Germany descended into hell and he said the first sign was when all questions of fact became questions of power. If we follow the truth and show respect for those scientists and others who devote their lives not to committing some massive fraud, but commit their lives instead to helping the rest of us understand the truth about our circumstances on this earth, we will answer that first question, must we change, loudly and boldly in the affirmative, yes, we must change. The second question, can we change? Here there is startling good news. This is not a forced version of hope relying on an act of will. It is also based on the recitation of facts. I remember when solar photovoltaic energy was uh, described as a pipe dream. I remember when only 12 years ago the predictions were that by the year 2010 the world might, if we were lucky, install one gigawatt of solar photovoltaic energy. That's a lot. The year 2010 came around and we beat that target 17 times over. Last year we beat that target 42 times over. This year we will beat that target 65 times over. That is an exponential curve. That is the same phenomena that we have seen uh, in computer chips, in flat screen TVs, in other areas of technology. Not all of them are like this, but other areas uh, do yield to research and development and determined efforts to try to push back the limits of the possible. We are seeing a revolution in renewable energy, not only in solar, but in wind. And now with the announcement just last week of the new Powerwall battery, we are seeing a sharp reduction in the cost of energy storage and energy efficiency. I'll give you an analogy. I remember as an inveterate early adopter when I bought one of the first mobile phones that were available on the market. You may remember, you are so young, you may not, but you may have seen pictures of them. When I got mine, I thought that that was the coolest thing in the world. I look at the pictures now and I realize that really looks ridiculous. But at the time I bought that phone, AT&T asked McKinsey to do a global market survey. How many of these can we sell by the year 2000, they asked. And the answer came back after a great deal of work, 900,000. The year 2000 arrived and sure enough they sold 900,000 in the first three days. And this year they will sell 1.2 billion of them and there are almost 7 billion of them in the world. How many people here no longer have a landline telephone and rely only on mobile phones? 30 years ago not a single hand would have gone up to that question. That is change. We can change. I spoke in this city three weeks ago and was followed to the stage by a woman from Georgia named Debbie Dooley, who was one of the founders of the National Tea Party Movement and the head of the Atlanta Tea Party. And she put solar panels on her roof a few years ago. And then, lo and behold, the Koch brothers sent through their emissaries instructions to the various tea parties, help us lobby for a measure in the Georgia State Legislature to put a tax on solar panels that people put on their roofs. And she said, what? So she formed an alliance between the Atlanta Tea Party and the Sierra Club and formed a new group called, wait for it, the Green Tea Party. 
And now they have been joined by the Christian Coalition, and they have launched an initiative in the state of Florida to put a measure on the ballot, eliminating all of the barriers to renewable energy. We are going to win this struggle. We are going to solve the climate crisis. At the end of this year in Paris, there will be an international negotiation. And yes, people have grown somewhat worried. Golly, that's a nice medal. Thank you so much. I just looked down at that. All these uh, treaty negotiations have left some people cynical and wary. But I remember a line from one of the great American poets, Wallace Stevens, who wrote, after the last no comes a yes. And on that yes, the future world depends. After the last no saying women should not have the vote, there came a yes. After the last no on abolition, that resulted in a yes. In the civil rights movement, there were many no's before there was a yes. That conversation was one I remember as a child in Tennessee hearing one of my friends make a racist comment and another friend spoke up and said, shut up, we don't talk like that anymore. And that conversation changed and millions did. Three years ago in California, the Associated Press wrote a story about two gay men waiting in line for a pizza holding hands and a homophobe walked by and made uh, a, an objectionable comment and according to the journalist every other person in that line turned on him and said stop it we don't accept that anymore we're winning that conversation we must win the conversation on global warming the final question is should we change that is a moral question we must change and we can change should we change? Is it the right thing to do? John Lewis used to quote the proverb, it was referred to in other words this morning, uh, th today rather, this afternoon, when you pray, move your feet. The reason why this third question is so important is that the climate crisis is an outward manifestation of an inner spiritual crisis. The vulnerabilities we all have as human beings to greed and the lust for power and self-preservation and narrowness are the barriers that stand in our pathway as we attempt to answer that third question, should we change? Once a question is resolved to a simple binary choice between what is right and what is wrong. The outcome is foreordained because of who we are as human beings. But we can take every strategy under the sun to try to avoid the resolution of important questions into that choice between what is right and what is wrong. And therefore, the charge to you is to address that question and use these magnificent skills that you have acquired to help us make that journey. Because the next generation will also have questions. I don't know what their main question will be. It will depend upon our answer to the three I've mentioned. And it will depend upon the circumstances in which they find themselves on this earth that we will bequeath to them. If they find themselves in a world of failing governance and climate refugees and rising seas and melting ice and stronger storms and deeper droughts and bigger floods and spreading tropical diseases and all of the horrors that the scientists have warned us that the evidence shows clearly would befall us if we do not act, they would be justified in looking back through the mists of time and asking of us here, what were you thinking? Did you think that it wasn't real? Did you think that you couldn't address it? Did you think that you shouldn't address it? Were you watching Dancing with the Stars? What was going on in your mind? But if they live in a world filled with a sense of renewal with tens of millions of new jobs in renewable energy and sustainable forestry and sustainable agriculture and they look at their own children and feel that hope in their hearts that their prospects will be better still, I want them to look back at us and ask, 
How did you find the moral courage to rise up and change? Part of the answer is going to be this graduating class. Thank you very much. standing. Eternal spirit, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and that shall be. Father and mother of us all, loving God in whom is heaven. The hollowing of your name echoes through the universe. The way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In the times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, from the grip of all that is evil. Us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. And so here we are at the end of this glorious days. So now the door is open and our ways part. The future stretches out before each of you. You shall go out in joy. You shall be led out in peace. All along the way, mountains and hills, they shall break into singing before you. Wild trees, they will clap their hands. Pine trees, they will grow where only thorns and myrtles were there, once only briars. And let us say together to the graduates, we honor your achievements and look to you with hope. And so together, let us say, let us go forth rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.